Next up is our keynote speaker, Greg Taylor, co-founder of Steam Whistle Brewing. Greg values happiness in the workplace as a key success factor for any business, but particularly one in the hospitality industry. Before co-founding Steam Whistle Brewing, Greg studied economics at the University of Toronto, then held sales positions in the media and technology industries. He then worked at the Upper Canada Brewing Company for eight years, where he held successive positions as sales manager, director of sales, and finally, vice president of sales. He left there in 1998 and established Nelson Cash Systems, an automated banking machine company taking advantage of the new, newly relaxed Bank Act that provided white label ABM machines to his contacts in the hospitality industry. In 1999, with Cam Heaps and Greg Cornwell, he developed the Steam Whistle business plan. Greg leads the creative collaboration Steam Whistle is known for, resulting in the brewery's many original marketing propositions. Greg's touch at human relations has helped them form the company's unique culture and lead to their winning sales team. In 2008, Greg and his partner were joint winners of the Entrepreneur of the Year Entrepreneurs of the Year Award, I always struggled with that one, uh, by Ernst & Young. In the last few years, Steam Whistle has won a gold medal at the Canadian Brewing Awards, has been named among Canada's greenest employers, among Canada's clean 50 corporations, Canada's most admired corporate cultures, and an eight-time winner of Canada's best managed companies. And on top of that, he's fairly local as well. So we appreciate you coming, Greg. Here he is, Greg Dale. I don't know if you need me here really today. Those videos were great, inspiring. I learned a lot. Um, so I think I'll start out with uh, part of my own personal story. I'd like to just give you some background on how Steam Whistle came to be. I grew up in St. Mary's, which is a small town uh, just outside of Stratford, Ontario. And uh, one time in the summer, I think I was in grade nine, my friend John and I were looking for something to do, talk to my father. We think we could get a job in town. We need, wanted to make some money. And he said, well, you know, the, the neighbor, Mrs. Harris, has a house she wants painted. Why don't you paint her house? And we were like, Dad, we don't have to paint a house. And he said, well, let's go over and talk with her. And if she agrees, I'll help you guys and teach you how to paint. So we thought, sure, we'll give it a shot. We went over and talked to her, and, and she agreed, as long as Dad helped out. And then we went down to the local paint shop, and they really helped us down there with all the materials, and they gave us some training. Anyway, we got at the, at working at the house, and the first thing we noticed is our buddies would come up and say, hey, Taylor, you're painting a house. You guys house painters now? And we were like, I guess so. <laughs> and, uh, and then my mom said, listen, put a sign out front, and uh, people come by, they'll realize you guys have a business, and you're painting houses now. So we got a piece of plywood there and painted it white, put some stenciled letters on it, and suddenly we had a little business. Now, what my dad was telling us was most important is, and especially in a small town, that you do a great job. That, all that, that was all that mattered. In fact, he said, do the best job you can. And at the end, because this is your first customer, give her a discount on the bill. Don't tell her you're going to do that in the beginning, beginning, but do that in the end. Make sure she, she's happy. Because what's important is word of mouth. Her friends will say, these kids painted your house. Did they do a good job? And hopefully she'll say, yeah, they did a great job, and it was great value. And for me, that was the first experience I had in business. And, and it also was the first experience hiring anybody. So in our second year, um, sometime in uh, sort of late April, we were preparing. We had some work that came in from the summer before that we couldn't complete. And uh, this gentleman on the right here, Kong Song, came up to me and said, Greg, I'm looking for a job. And here I was, sort of low 70s grades in high school. This guy had 97%. He was like the leading guy in our county. And he wanted a job from me. I just couldn't believe it that actually you know, this idea that my dad had, had put us in a position where we had this little business and then we became employers. And we, we again focused on quality, making sure that every time we left the house that we were painting, that it was done to the exception or over and above the uh, expectation of, of our customers. And eventually we had a little business where we had six employees. And that really gave us a look into the future about what we could do with our own careers and maybe a small business was the direction to take. So I left that behind and uh, moved to uh, Toronto, went to U of T. I'm officially a dropout. I went to U of T for two years taking economics. I was just so bored with it. Uh, I didn't see it as something I could really stick out, and I left and 
actually became a, a frozen pizza salesman down in West Virginia working for my uncle. He heard that I left U of T and called me and said he's got this great little business where you go into restaurants and give them these stainless steel ovens and in turn they buy your pizza and, uh, and they sell it to customers behind the bar. Instead of having a chef during the day in, in small bars in the area down there, they, then they could use our system and serve food, which was required as part of selling alcohol. And what was interesting, I just wanted to pass on, and my uncle said to me, it, I came home at dinner one night, and I said, you know, Jim, the formula we have for this business is great because everyone wants a free oven. They love the idea of simple, simply prepared foods in their bar. But the, the pizza's a crap. So, and I was thinking back to the painting thing I learned from my father. I said, Jim, what if, you know, I don't know anyone here in town at all, so what if on weekends we rent a little kitchen and I'll make fresh pizza, flash freeze it, and then when I go out as a sales guy Monday morning, I'll have great product. And he said, no, we're not in the business of making great pizza. We're in the business of making money. And I just thought, that doesn't work. I love my uncle, but I thought he was wrong at the time. So I left and drove back to Toronto. I became a bike courier, and I met my current wife, Sybil, and she was working at the Upper Canada Brewing Company, started by a gentleman by the name of Frank Heaps in 1985, one of the first craft breweries in Canada. And uh, it was a great place to hang out. In fact, Sybil got invited in her first summer, so she was going to Laurier on a co-op program and, and got placed at uh, Upper Canada, which was in Toronto, uh, for the summertime. And at uh, some, po some point in the summer, she got invited to Frank's house for uh, a meal, a dinner, whatever. And she said, you better bring a tie. I don't know who's going to be there. So I rode my bike up to his house and had this tie on. And I was running a little late and uh, knocked on the door of this nice uh, house in uh, North Toronto. And there was nobody. Nobody answered the door, but the door was ajar. And so I heard music, and I sort of pushed the door open. And I realized what was happening was not a dinner with the senior managers where I'd have to remember all my manners and which side you know, fork goes on, et cetera. But, but there was a kegger going on. And Frank had invited everybody from his brewery to his house. And I walked in, and, and he greeted me. And, and I realized right away what type of employer he was. He, he was connecting with each, uh, each member of uh, his staff that had come out. In fact, people like myself that were friends of friends. And uh, he, I had a good chat with him. He asked me what I was doing and you know, said, would I be interested in working at a brewery at some point? And I was like, are you kidding me? It'd be great. <laughs> but that really stuck with me that this guy cared. And, and uh, so uh, I worked away at uh, getting a job there. And eventually, uh, 1988, the end of 1988, I got a part-time job delivering beer for Frank. And that's when I really started my, what I like to call, uh, University of Craft Beer. I worked there for uh, over 10 years with Frank, and uh, wow, what, a, what an incredible culture he had. People loved coming to work in the morning, and we really got along. It was very social, and, uh, and everyone made contributions to that business, I, I believe, at the time, because they wanted to. We had a great opportunity, <coughs> opportunity to look at the alternative. When uh, a company came in, Frank had a, um, a financial arrangement that was done in uh, 1994, I believe, to bring in a... a uh, some finances, lower the debt. He wanted to uh, repackage the product, do some advertising because sales had flattened out a bit. And these folks came in and introduced a completely different culture. They took over running the operation and they had a meeting with all, all the staff and said, uh, basically, listen, you guys have been spoiled working for this company. It's a very family-oriented culture. We need to change that. You need to think about the bottom line. You need to think about growing the business. You need to think big. For an, as an example, you guys each get a 12-pack of stack beer to take home at the end of every week. That's a bit ridiculous. We're going to cut it down to a six-pack. And at the end of this lecture he was giving us, he actually said, go team. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> it's just not going to work. So uh, then they brought in auditors to audit all the business. And at the time, I was in charge of sales and distribution. And I had started delivering beer when I was quite young quite a bit younger. And uh, the auditor met with me and the, and the new president and, uh, in the boardroom, and he said, listen, we found a way to cut costs and get more deliveries done. Your guys are doing about 25 deliveries a day in the city to beer stores, liquor stores, and restaurants. We think we can get it up to 50. And I just said, guys, I've done this. This, this is not going to happen. 50 deliveries. Don't be negative. This is how we're going about it. So the auditor then explained that he had gone in to uh, restaurants and bars with our drivers. And he said, your guys know people's names. They're going in there. They're helping the staff out. They're moving kegs from upstairs, downstairs, into their basements. They're rotating the kegs so that they're fresh code. We caught one of your guys fixing a Sleeman draft line just before lunchtime. 
uh, for a customer. So we're going to have to let him go. The model is going to be this, the UPS model. So your guys are going to come in, drop the kegs at the back door, get a signature, and get out of there. That's the only way we can do this properly and make money. And uh, I just said, guys, this is not going to work. We're a small business. We're not a large international corporation. We don't have the funds to buy distribution in these places. The way we've developed our business is through a relationship of trust with our customers, uh, building the business together, coming up with ideas that will help them, fixing the guy's draft line. If he's in a situation where he's going to lunch and one of his products isn't going to run, we'll fix that. Because think about what that restaurateur is thinking about us, that we were willing to spend the time to do that for them. They're never going to forget that. When it comes time for some another company to try to take our draft tap away and put theirs in, they're going to think, no, we like these guys over Canada. So anyway, over about 12 months, we went from making over a million dollars a year to losing $900,000 just with this new culture of focusing on the bottom line. And we learned from that and realized what Frank had started in the beginning, the idea that people, if they're dedicated, if they wake up on Monday morning and aren't dreading going to work in the morning, if they can invest in the business, that you'll have a better company. Maybe not focusing on the bottom line, but focusing on the people will create profit for your business. Mm -hmm.